Okay, thanks uh, for joining us and uh, good afternoon. This is the um, panel which looks uh, inside Cayman's hedge fund industry. Um, the, the title for this panel is that uh, hedge, uh, Cayman is the leading jurisdiction for the domicile of hedge funds and uh, we are to look at the state of the industry and the pros and cons of Cayman for sponsors and investors. And in particular, we're going to be looking at professional directors, conflicts of interest, transparency, regulation, and cost. Uh, my name is Matt Mulry. I'm with Dylan Eustace. We're a uh, financial services firm. We're the largest financial services firm in uh, Dublin, in Ireland. And we practice Irish and Cayman Islands law. And I head up the Cayman Islands office for the firm. Uh, to my left is Don Seymour. Don is the founder of DMS Offshore Investment Services and serves as Vice President of the Cayman Islands Directors Association. Don is also a member of the Financial Services Council of the Cayman Islands Government, which provides strategic advice to the government on financial services industry in Cayman. And to my far left is John Prout. He is an Executive Director of the Foundation for Fund Governance in Washington, D.C. And John has previously set up and run trading desks at a number of major international banks. He's also served on the boards and the investment committees of a number of hedge funds. Um, so thanks to you guys for joining me. And turning to our first uh, sub subject, uh, professional directors. Now there's been considerable interest uh, in the role of Cayman hedge fund directors following the financial crisis and the weavering decision in August 2011. And that interest has led to revised corporate governance codes, codes in most offshore jurisdictions. In order to effectively adopt good corporate governance practices, it's essential that we understand the approaches that are taken to the provision of directorship services in the uh, in, uh, uh, directorship services to Cayman hedge funds. And if I could start then, John, by asking you to take us through the different models uh, which you've seen being used for the provision of directorship services. Sure. Um, thank you. Actually, these are just talking points for us to sort of have a, a little debate or discussion on. Um, what are the different models? I think there's just too many to count. Um, so I've picked sort of the three common formats, starting with uh, the individual or personal director, which um, using a medical analogy, which uh, probably is going to get me into trouble, I call the concierge doctor model, where you basically have an individual that's, got, uh, that's selected for his judgment, skills, and experience. Uh, oftentimes somebody who's retired, um, or in a current position uh, in the financial services industry, uh, may have specific skills such as language speaking uh, that's relevant to the particular fund or a derivatives background or an accounting background or a legal background. Um, second point or second characteristic, has the time and energy to personally prepare, attend and participate in the board meetings and committee meetings that are required. And third point or characteristic, likely to remain independent since the likelihood of, of, or since he doesn't have to rely on director fee income for his livelihood. Um, and perhaps more importantly for those directors in the United States, personally liable, personal assets on the line uh, in the case you're found negligent as a director. Um, and probably in most cases, uh, familiar with the manager and with the investors. This model has some weak points. First of all, such directors, if they're not resident in the domicile where the fund has been set up, may not be licensed and certainly is not going to be regulated or necessarily known by the local regulator. It does open up the possibility that the hedge fund manager chooses some, somebody that's rather accommodating or compliant, as we saw in the case of Weavering. Uh, and third, uh, more often than not, m probably lacks the experience uh, in AML, KYC, and the compliance and legal and regulatory issues that concern um, uh, a fund. The second model uh, is more the boutique that we're becoming familiar with, uh, which is a partnership structure basically of, if you keep the analogy, concierge doctors. Uh, these individuals are personally liable, but the partnership is licensed or supervised by the regulators in the domicile that they've set up. Uh, Cayman in particular has an increasing number. Um, the cons of that is there's obviously limited scale because m these boutiques self-impose on the number of 
relationships that they establish and the number of appointments they take on, um, the ability to extend their institutional knowledge is also therefore limited unless they bring in additional partners. And last but not least, the likelihood of this model working is going to be dependent upon the evolution of fund governance continuing. Uh, that brings us to the full service professional fiduciary services model, uh, which we're familiar with. Uh, and I think Don can speak more to that. Um, we would just make a couple of points that it's been the most popular model for probably a business, two business reasons. One, it's priced for it to be attractive to hedge fund managers who are cost sensitive. And secondly, um, at least in, in my personal opinion, towards hedge fund managers that uh, prefer more independence rather than oversight. Um, over their uh, activities. The cons is that uh, the jumbo directors, as it's commonly called, has, has a, at the very least an, the appearance uh, of um, insufficient bandwidth to devote to fiduciary duties. And there are also some of these professional fiduciaries that double dip by also providing legal and accounting fees through affiliates, uh, which create the open themselves up to potential conflicts of interest. And last, there is a not terribly well-known phenomena where the employees that are acting as directors are personally liable, and yet, um, and I've reversed this thing, uh, it's Paget Brown, not Brown Paget, as a court uh, case that I understand, basically protects the employer from being sued in the case where the employee acting in the director capacity is deemed negligent. And that's sort of a bizarre uh, kind of situation which is not terribly familiar in the US. I'll pass this on to Don. Thanks, Tom. Don, maybe you could just give us your view on, on the pros and cons outline there and maybe tell us how DMS operates. Sure, and thank you, Matt. I think it's important before I talk about where we are today is to talk about where we've been because it's very important that you understand the history of this issue uh, because that has shaped uh, the direction of the growth of the industry in the Cayman Islands. So I'll take you back to 1997 when I was hired by the Cayman Islands government uh, to be the first head of investment services at the Cayman Islands uh, Monetary Authority. Now, they hired me to uh, develop the regulatory framework for hedge funds. And back then, uh, the Cayman Islands didn't appear on the league tables in the hedge fund industry at all. If anything, we might have crept in uh, to number 10 on a league table 1 to 10. So my job was to write all the policies and procedures, hire all the staff, set the general uh, policy direction, for the hedge fund sector in the Cayman Islands. And as I did this, and the industry started to become very successful, I saw that in addition to attracting the good funds, we were also attracting some bad funds. So back then, I was responsible for the entire sector, so I was responsible for authorization, supervision, and enforcement of the hedge fund sector. So I had to take enforcement actions against the bad hedge funds that we were finding in the sector. And what I saw at that time was that the common thread throughout all of those enforcement actions was the fact that the funds didn't have good fund governance. And I rationalized uh, back then that governance needed to improve if the hedge fund industry was going to continue to grow, if it was going to continue to be successful in Cayman. We had the best directors in the world. Well, well not, sorry, uh, we had the best administrators in the world. We had the best lawyers. We had the best accountants. Uh, but what we didn't have was good directors uh, back in the late 90s. So I would go out to the industry, I would give speeches, and I tried to persuade the industry that they needed to improve governance practices or we were going to suffer some severe issues in terms of continuing to grow the industry. 
and nobody really listened because back then uh, nobody treated governance seriously. So in 2000, I said that I was going to do this myself. And I set up DMS in 2000. We were only one person uh, back then. And DMS grew from there uh, to over 200 people today. Uh, we're in six offices around the world. And we uh, represent client funds with over you know, 275 uh, billion in assets. So what is behind that success? What is, why, why have uh, DMS uh, become so successful? Because a large part of the success of governance in the Cayman Islands has been uh, the success of, of DMS. Uh, as DMS became more successful, more and more people were attracted to the industry. And today, uh, the Cayman Islands has become a magnet for uh, governance professionals all over the world who are attracted to the Cayman Islands to set up uh, governance services. So it's, it's been a great success story. So what has made it different? What I saw from my time as the chief regulator was that if governance was going to be effective, it needed to be a process. There is no single mind of any one director can comprehend or manage the full range of risk in any hedge fund. So you cannot effectively manage risk without a process. So the idea behind DMS was that we would have that process, that we would, it would be a system of checks and balances. And today, uh, I, I know John's uh, comment about the perception of lack of oversight, but it, it's to the contrary of that. Every single transaction, every single governance transaction uh, at DMS is reviewed three times. So mm, there's a system of checks and balances that really helps help the funds uh, to better manage risk. So as we see, as we see governance evolve, uh, it, some, will, some will say that it is a quantitative uh, calculation. It's, uh, it's X amount of directorships and X amount of board meetings, and that is the governance formula. That has not been our experience, and we have been uh, doing this uh, longer than than anyone in the industry. It's now been 13 years. So in our experience, what we find is that the governance failures are usually in those services where there is not a process. Whether you're a single director uh, on your own or you're a single director in a firm, you do need to have an effective system of risk management to avoid governance failures. Yeah, just add um, a, a, a trader and hedge fund manager's perspective, starting actually from 1997, Dom, because that was actually when I uh, first went to the BVI. I, I couldn't afford Cayman at the time to set up uh, a fund of hedge funds. And I met with Barclays Private Bank, who did fund administration, but realized that uh, they really didn't know how to do an NAV. They could just do subscriptions and redemptions. So I then got Mark Chapman at Deloitte, who was the partner, to do the NAV accounting. And then I thought it would be good to get a, his competitor, John Greenwood, at KPMG, to be the auditor for our fund of funds. And so we've had a, a real stellar, stellar startup. And um, we totally forgot the idea of a director until I think it was Barclays that said, by the way, you need a director, at which point we said, why? And then we were told, well, it's a company, and so on and so forth. And I think a lot of people in the hedge fund industry back then really had that same afterthought reaction of, well, we have to have directors on our offshore funds. And you know, f fund governance is not just about directors. Um, I would say that 10 years ago, the hot topic uh, when I was speaking at, at conferences was portfolio transparency. We started in the 80s and 90s with high net worth individuals as the primary uh, investing group in hedge funds. And as institutions started to come in, they wanted to know 
well, what's in the portfolio? It wasn't good enough to say, trust me, don't worry, I've got the best stocks that I'm going to have or the best uh, credit derivative, blah, blah, blah. So the demand for transparent portfolio transparency was the first real driver by the institutional investing community. Then in 2008, it became custody. Custody, of course, triggered by Madoff, because all of a sudden those assets that were custodied weren't there. And then in 2009, as people tried to get out of their investments during the 08 crisis as liquidity dried up, the issuance of side pockets became to the forefront. And that's when the institutional investors focused on directors and saying, well, how did this happen? We wanted our money back and all of a sudden they've been suspended for a year or we're only getting 80 cents or 70 cents on the dollar and the rest of it in this funny paper called the side pocket and so on and so forth. So we've had a transformation in the industry where we've gone from different stages as far as uh, governance is concerned and it's all been institutionally driven. Um, so, and, and to this day, uh, and, and my favorite comment is of a New York lawyer who sets up a lot of hedge funds. He said the problem is that hedge fund managers still refer to their business as my fund. And it's not their fund. It's the investor's fund. And when you're talking about very strong-willed hedge fund managers, it makes the job of a director very tough. And, you know, there, that's why we have the different models. That's why we have the different approaches. Uh, you have people who leave the Goldmans and Morgan Stanleys of the world and basically say, I'm free of my bosses, I'm an entrepreneur, and I don't want to have to account to anybody except my investors. They're either going to like it or not, and they'll walk if they don't. And they don't quite understand that to receive institutional money, particularly from tax exempts, that that privilege of managing or investing money comes with a responsibility. And whether it's going to be driven by independent directors, or whether it's going to be driven by the investors themselves, or the hedge fund managers wake up, or worse, the regulators step in, it will occur uh, over time. Thanks, John. Uh, one of the issues that we're, uh, we will consider on this panel is also conflicts of interest. And uh, uh, the, a, a classic conflict arises with one of the common types of directorship services firm uh, that's, that's common in, in Cayman. And that's where a, a law firm sets up its own fiduciary services company, which I think is the HMO model that John refers to in his slides. Uh, the structure of these companies is that the, the law firm partners or the most influential of those law firm partners own uh, the, the company that's providing directorship services. And commonly there's a, a direct referral made by the law firm who acts for the investment manager at the establishment of the, of the fund, uh, refers the, uh, uh, the, the directors to the fund directly. Uh, and so you end up with a fund that's been established. The, the law firm is now acting for the fund, having moved on uh, from having the manager as its client. And the, the directors who act on the board of the fund have their salaries, their bonuses, their employment uh, heavily influenced by that, by that law firm. Uh, whilst there are other uh, um, services uh, or service providers in Cayman who provide mixed services directors and, and other fund services, I think that the, the law firm and, and the director's business is perhaps one that has become uh, talked about uh, most in, in, uh, in, in recent times. And uh, there's been a move largely influenced by investors away from those types of uh, directors being used on funds and towards split boards where you'd have uh, a director provided by one fiduciary services company and a second director provided by another um, in order to reduce that perceived conflict. Uh, maybe, Don, I could I ask you how you see those conflicts of interest um, affecting the industry? Sure, uh, and thanks again, Matt, for that question. As it relates to legal counsel serving as directors, uh, certainly uh, this can lead to several conflicts of, of interest. Uh, I'll, I'll start first. Uh, 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 the, uh, the law firms will say, well, uh, well you have two models. Uh, you have essentially uh, the model that exists in, in Ireland, and then 
uh, you have the model that maybe exists in Cayman and, and other places. Although in, in Cayman as well, you, you do find on certain occasions uh, a bit of the Irish model. In the Irish model, you essentially have the lawyers themselves, which will serve uh, as directors on hedge funds. And, uh, and that is problematic in, in the sense that, well, you certainly can't give an act on, on the same advice uh, that would present a conflict of interest. Also, as it relates to capacity, certainly uh, a, a lawyer, a busy uh, hedge fund lawyer is probably charging you know, 2,000 hours a year or more uh, serving clients. So one struggles to understand how a, a lawyer can present a timesheet uh, with those hours and also then say that uh, they have uh, devoted significant time and attention uh, to discharging their duties uh, as a director. So in, in, inherently, I see some conflicts there. As it relates to the way that the practice is followed in the Cayman Islands, uh, where the law firms will set up uh, separate companies and employ uh, directors which they offer to the, law, to the funds that they advise, I see that conflicts of interest can uh, develop uh, with that model in the sense that uh, certainly uh, the employees of the fiduciary arm you know, is acting on the advice of, of the law firm. And there has been at least one high profile case in which uh, the court raised significant concern about whether or not uh, the directors in that case, and this is the Cayman Islands court, by the way. So the court raised significant concern about whether or not the directors in that case were acting in the best interest of the fund, which they are obliged to do under the law, or they were acting in the best interest of, of the law firm. Uh, because in that case, uh, the law firm had a significant uh, business relationship with the sponsor of those hedge funds. And there was considerable evidence, even though the court did not specifically address that issue, there was specific, uh, you know, significant evidence that the court found. And to use the Chief Justice's term, he said he was led to an irresistible impression that the directors had, uh, had, had acted in what was the best interest of the, of the law firm. So those conflicts can be quite significant and in that case can be quite devastating to investors. And uh, uh, investors today are more focused on it. It's likely to, it's likely to, be, it's likely to move into sharper focus as well once the SEC starts to focus on on this issue. Uh, un undoubtedly, you, you know by now that most managers are regulated by the SEC, and the SEC last October, they started their, uh, what they call their presence exams, which means that uh, they're making a sweep throughout the industry, and they're going to be examining the practices of all the newly registered hedge fund managers. Now. Uh, the SEC has what is called its exempted rules. And for you to rely on them, you have to be independent. And the SEC has a, a, a director, I mean. Um, and the SEC has a very strict uh, definition of what independence is. And uh, the way that the industry is practiced in, in Cayman, it's unlikely that it would meet uh, that level of independence, which means if you, uh, that a director of a law firm affiliate would not likely be able to apply on the, to rely on the exempted rules, you know, if the SEC uh, takes issue with that. So it's an issue, I mean, we're, we're just at the, some, uh, uh, the law firm that I mentioned in, in the last case that l where the judge was led to the irresistible impression. Uh, that the directors did not do the right thing. Uh, that law firm has exited uh, this practice, and uh, this issue is still uh, is still still evolving, and uh, we'll see you know how things go in the next year or so. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I I would add um, it's it's the appearance of bias and not just the presence of bias that I think is the troubling issue when when you do have this kind of uh, conflict of interest in, in, um, with legal firms providing directorships. But if, if we take the larger picture here, um, 
it, it's hard for me to imagine, well, there's only one way that I would feel comfortable as an investor where, uh, with a board that uh, had the ability to keep in check some of these inherent conflicts of interest that you're going to have by definition, and that is through the split board. And this is the, um, not that I like taking the United States as, a, as an example because the GPLP structure, we have no governance for hedge funds uh, in this country, but uh, since I'm in Miami on U.S. soil, if I can cite the U.S. mutual fund industry, we have a majority of the mutual fund boards are independent directors. They do have their own independent legal counsel on retainer, separate from that of the fund manager. So there are uh, aspects that, that control the conflict of interest. Um, I think we can see some improvement that needs to be done in the hedge fund industry. Um, there are, uh, what we've done by data mining the SEC and other websites, we, we combed through 13,000 documents and we have 10,900 directorships that have been identified around the world, um, held by 1,900 individuals on roughly 5,000, uh, sorry, 7,000 funds. Um, 5,500 of the 10,900 directorship positions we've identified are held by the 223 Cayman residents that we have identified from SEC, principally Form D, and ADV Part 2 filings. Um, this universe that you're seeing here, that mass blob in the middle, are where the majority of those 10,900 directorship positions are. And you'll notice the reason why I'm putting the, uh, you see the outer uh, data points, are those are uh, directorships in different countries, but they're not connected to each other. They're not split boards. Uh, if we go and look at split board relationships, which is what this graph uh, shows you, and the size of the dots, the larger dots are where the fiduciary directors have, the, lar the more positions that one individual has, the bigger the circle. Um, so you'll see that, and let's call them jumbo directors, you'll see in the BVI on the left in crimson color, that's a jumbo director, uh, a fiduciary in the BVI, and then there's a few in, in um, uh, quite a number in Cayman, and then there's an orange one in Bermuda. But the interrelationships that they have, who are they sitting on the board of? So you'll see Jersey and Luxembourg are providing directors on a particular uh, n number of funds. The thicker the lines, the more funds in which they're having split board relationships. So what we'd like to see is more thicker lines between the different jurisdictions to give a split board where you have directors from different jurisdictions with different perspectives and therefore uh, improved level of, of governance. I mean, uh, other than this, uh, there's a, in a, I've seen this information before and I mean, there are tremendous gaps in it. I can think of uh, many service providers in Cayman that would either be um, uh, would probably be not just Cayman, but actually Ireland and Luxembourg as well, which would be uh, disappointed to see that uh, they're not on, on the list. So it's really hard for me to speak uh, to that information. Um, I think it really needs to be scrubbed and um, uh, maybe uh, do, uh, and maybe a redo is, is necessary. But other than that, uh, when you think about uh, split boards, I think about, well, what are you seeking to achieve? I mean, it, it's a fallacy uh, to say that all directors think alike. Uh, when you build a board, you try to build a board that has a mix of, of uh, talents and experiences. Uh, that's key. Uh, this idea of, of splitting, uh, it's already split. Uh, directors' duties are joint and several, and any director will uh, will will tell you that. So, uh, this idea that a, a director is just going to go along with another director, I think it's a silly director that actually does that. Uh, when you look at the way that the hedge fund business actually works, and you look at what people want, 
uh, from their boards. Uh, the boards today are more consultative. Uh, they want people with a mix of, of talents that can help them uh, better run the fund. So uh, you want people on there with regulatory experience, accounting experience, uh, you know, uh, compliance, everything. Uh, you, you want a range of, of talents on your board. And you should pick your board like you do any other service provider. Uh, you, you pick them based on their talent, based on their competence, based on their experience, based on their track record. And also, and this is very important, on an alignment of interests. Now, when I say that, uh, the first tendency is, well, uh, what do you mean uh, an alignment of interests? And I note John's earlier comments about the manager referring to it as his fund, you know. And the idea is, is that uh, all of the service providers need to be aligned. They have to all be working towards the what's in the best interest of that fund. So not just an alignment uh, with the manager, but also an alignment with the, surf with the administrator, uh, with the auditor. Everyone needs to work. It's a fund control structure, and you can't have dysfunction within the fund control structure. If you have uh, dysfunction, it's, it will mean losses for the investors. So you, you do have to have directors who truly understand that. And, and, and directors who are not an antagonistic to that. If you truly believe that, it, that you can put in some idea of a Superman director who is going to, uh, who is going to uh, uh, mitigate all your risks of in investing in a fund, don't invest in that fund. If you truly have concerns about uh, the integrity of that manager or any other service provider, then no, no director is, is going to save you. No service provider is, is going to save you. You have generally, any, in the 13 years uh, that I've been doing this, uh, I will tell you that m most managers want to do the right thing. Most managers act in the best interest of, of their investors. The instances of fraud and, and bad dealings are actually very, very small. You know, cases like wavering are very rare. For the most part, you invest in a Cayman Islands fund. That fund is going to be run by people who have integrity. So it really depends on what your premise is. If your premise is that uh, uh, m m most of the industry is bad and directors are, are, are going to mitigate that risk for you, then don't invest to begin with. I, I think I would uh, beg to differ slightly in the sense that we have a model called trust, which I agree with Don, but verify. Uh, and, we th and there are no supermen directors, we agree with that, which is why split boards are an important element of fund governance in, in our opinion. Um, and in all defense to our database, I would say that every single piece of information we have is backed up by a, a filing with a regulatory authority. Most of them are SEC, and they're all available on our, on our website. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, so there's been a, a call for greater transparency in all financial services industries, and it's been a common call amongst uh, politicians, regulators, uh, and investors. Uh, now, Cayman imposes a, a, an overarching requirement to disclose all necessary information to enable an informed investment decision, and uh, the regulator doesn't prescribe specific transparency requirements. And uh, uh, as such, Cayman has evolved a, a transparency which has been driven by investor demand rather than by regulatory interference. And uh, I mean, John, you can see, has put together a, a large database uh, of information on investment funds. And perhaps, John, you can uh, give us an idea of what the key areas that investors should be considering when, uh, when they're looking at transparency requirements or additional transparency requirements from funds. Well, let's first start as to why is this important? Why should institutional investors have more information? And this gives you just an idea of the, as, as Don knows very well, better than all of us, how important Cayman is in the hedge fund world for U.S. tax-exempt investors. Um, if 
just based on our limited, very limited resources, we were able to download from the Department of Labor and the U.S. Treasury Form 990s, filings that are required of U.S. tax-exempt institutions, by which I mean public and private pension funds, university endowments, labor unions, um, city, state, municipalities, and so forth. And not all of those filings, in fact, only a small number of those filings actually detail their hedge fund investments. But as you can see, we were able to take 181 institutions, 180 if you eliminate the one fund of funds in the upper right-hand corner, uh, and identify $145 billion worth of hedge fund investments. And this is actually 2010, December 2010 data, so it's obviously larger than it is now. So if you take a look at some of the names, Pennsylvania Retirement, Carolina, we have very substantial institutional investors that are tax exempt, that are investing in hedge funds, and there's a good portion of what they invest, as you can see in the lower side, um, came in benefits from many, many tens of billions of dollars of U.S. tax-exempt money. Um, overall, uh, if I just, we have 6,000 funds and have identified almost $4 trillion uh, of investor assets uh, that have been placed in 6, 000, over 6,000 hedge funds. So that's the reason why we want to know what uh, the importance of, um, of the transparency. Um, i just go back. Now, Cayman Monetary Authority is proposing opening up its database. Our attitude is that whether they do this or not, somebody in the public or private sector will eventually get it. And the SEC already provides that in, unfortunately, not a very data-friendly form. So it took us well over a year and a half to get these 10,000 uh, directorship appointments uh, identified, but they are all signed by the directors and their companies noted. So this is not going to be um, something that I think is a big issue. It'll just come out as it is already doing. Thanks, Joe. And, and talk to yes. Yeah, sure. uh, just quickly on the transparency issue, uh, as uh, uh, as Matt said in his comment that uh, Cayman is a disclosure-oriented regime. Any, it's also a regime for sophisticated investors. Any investor can get any information that they need to successfully invest in a fund. I truly don't understand the obsession uh, with numbers. If you want my number, I'll give it to you right now. It's 158. Uh, I also, I. I also will tell you the amount of meetings uh, that I do every year. I, I, do an average of, I do an average two meetings every day. I probably do between four and 500 meetings a year. Uh, this is all that we do. We are full-time uh, directors. Uh, we're not part-time retired guys. We're full-time directors working in a professional firm with, with professional people surrounded by sophisticated technology and we have an unbelievable process that manages risk uh, better than anyone else in the world and that's why we have become successful. It's just untenable for anyone to suggest that an, an investor can go to a sponsor and be able to negotiate any form of side letter that they want but not be able to get uh, information from from a director i mean it's purely a you know solution in in search of a problem so the whole uh, idea behind transparency in my view it's not asking the right questions i do believe that fund governance should be regulated that's why i actually set out on this mission over 13 years ago to do something about improving uh, fund governance but fund governance should be regulated the same that you would regulate any other service provider to a fund. And there are fundamental tenets of regulation that as are fundamental as accounting assets and liabilities and, and, and equity. You have authorization, you have supervision, and you have enforcement. So uh, the, I think that we in, in the Cayman Islands should regulate the area 
uh, in in a proper way. There should be there should be a regulation around authorization that only the right people, uh, you know, with the necessary qualifications and so on, are authorized. Then you have. Uh, you have supervision, which means that it's quite clear what the expectations are of those people. And then in the end, you have enforcement, which is if those people don't act in the manner that they should act, then you disqualify them or you take some other uh, type of sanction against them. So as we move forward, these transparency and databases and so on, they don't address the real issue. And the real issue is this. This is the last unregulated sector in the hedge fund control structure. Uh, let me say again, every other service provider to a fund is regulated except the directors. It's, it's, it's just a gap, and the gap needs to be closed, and you should regulate them the same way you would an administrator, an auditor, a prime broker, authorization, supervision, and enforcement. Thanks, Don. And um, we, we're a bit tight on time for this panel, so certain members of the panel need to, to ca catch flights this evening. So uh, um, <coughs> what I'm going to do is just very quickly deal with regulation and then uh, invite any questions um, that you might have for, for the panel. Uh, and many of you will know that SEMA are, or have been in the process of, of consulting on a corporate governance code, uh, and the key uh, elements of that code are uh, disqualification provisions for directors, limits on the number of directorships held, and a public register of directors. Um, and Don, maybe if I can invite you to, to give us just very briefly your view on, on those proposals and, and if, you, if you're able to, uh, share your thoughts on how the consultation process is being conducted. Sure. Well, Mara, I may have said some of this before, may have uh, got ahead of myself. Uh, we believe, uh, uh, we mean in DMS, uh, DMS believes that uh, the uh, that fund governance should be regulated. It should be regulated in in a proper form, which means uh, a, a regime that allows for authorization, supervision, and enforcement of uh, hedge fund directors. We think that's very important for the future growth of the industry. Uh, as it relates uh, to the SEMA consultation process, uh, we don't feel that it has it goes far enough and it addresses uh, the right questions. I think that it would be important for uh, the regulator to look back at the experiences in the, in the Cayman Island sector and do uh, develop a regulatory solution to, uh, to address those concerns. Specifically, uh, the uh, regulator should take note of what has happened in the Weaverin case, for instance, and other cases in, in Cayman, and take the lessons from there and and applied and use those lessons to develop regulatory solutions. Thanks, sir. And John, maybe you could give us our, your views on the code. Yeah, the only thing I would add is uh, I think from, from an outsider's perspective, it was disappointing that the Cayman Island Directors Association was unable to come up with a, its own response to the Cayman Monetary Authority's proposals. And that's sort of, to me, symptomatic of the situation that we have, that there is a broad uh, mix of opinions and, and hence the reason and importance of having the transparency so not only people on the island can express their, their thoughts but investors and, and others outside of, of the island given the importance that Cayman holds as, as virtually 70% of the hedge fund industry. Thanks, Tom. And then um, just being conscious of time, maybe I could just ask if anyone's got any questions to our panel on any of the issues that we've, we've discussed. Do you mean the minimum uh, around, around the director, directorship services? What's, what's the current regulation? Right. Um, that, in a sense, is, is the essence of, of the problem. Because right now you have over 10,000 individuals who serve on Cayman Islands funds all over the world. 
There are about 250 of those individuals who are based in the Cayman Islands. So uh, uh, the issue that SEMA would have would be how do you effectively regulate you know, some 9,000 plus directors who sit outside of the, juris of the jurisdiction. Now, it, it's, also, uh, uh, it's, oh, it, it's also important to know that there are no restrictions whatsoever on who can serve a, as a director to a Cayman Islands Fund, and there are no minimum uh, qualifications for that. Uh, w that in itself I I is not an issue to me personally, but I certainly uh, do take issue with the fact that if someone doesn't do what they are supposed to do, uh, that the regulator won't uh, disqualify that individual. And there's, there's certainly, if you look back at, at the Weavering case, for instance, those, uh, those directors are still fit and proper to serve on another Cayman Islands fund. And w we think that is an untenable situation and that needs to be rectified. And that the regulator should focus on, 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 on a regime that will address those issues. Um, and, and that actually proves, I think, our foundation's point that they are able, the Weaving directors can serve on another fund. And I can tell you that directors that have been sanctioned in the Southern District Court of New York are serving on hundreds of funds as we speak. Uh, so we don't have a disqualification program. And until we do, we believe that the transparency issue is, is important for investors. Yes, Simon. Simon, uh, we don't have a good answer for you about why it hasn't happened. I mean, we strongly believe uh, that it should happen, and uh, we think that all of the discussion around, you know, uh, transparency and databases is fine. I mean, even if you want to do that too, but address the real issues, we need proper regulation. We need authorization, supervision, and enforcement. And uh, I mean, you know uh, as as well as I how the mutual fund the mutual funds law is structured and how it regulates other service providers to the fund, and we're advocating for that for for directors as well. Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, they, they, there's, there's two. There's, there's, there's two approaches. One is is you would rely on the articles where there would be an indemnification provision from the fund to the directors, but there, there would be uh, an exclusion for uh, any negligence, uh, fraud, or willful default commonly included within those indemnifications. So if, if a director was at fault, you wouldn't expect those indemnification provisions to bite. You would look at the Articles of Association. Uh, there, I, I, I'd imagine it would be for, the, for litigation. Is that right, Simon? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it may be important for you to know that uh, the negligence standard, and uh, I mean, we have a lot of lawyers here who can clarify, but, and, and I'm not one. Um, but the negligence, there's no concept of gross negligence in the Cayman Islands. So it's not as uh, uh, easy as it, it, it may sound. So a negligence in, in Cayman would be essentially what you may know as gross negligence in, in the US or in Delaware. Right? So it, it means that the director would have done something really bad and he would not be, he would not be indemnified. He, he would not be indemnified for that if he's done something really bad. I think I have that right. <laughs> and a lawyer can clarify. <laughs> Always get a bit iffy when I give legal advice. <laughs> 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 Maybe we should wind up there. Yeah. Um, well, thanks everyone for, for listening to the, to the panel, and, and sorry we have to, to cut it slightly short. Um, you know, if, if you had one just to, to go on, but uh, thank you. <laughs>